Hi, everyone. For those of you that know me know that the pancreas is my favorite organ, so I was really, really honored to be here, so I appreciate the course directors who invited me. And I hope to give you a little bit of a snippet of what I do as a registered dietitian in our clinic and how I work with pancreatic disorders um, from a nutrition perspective and highlight exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, otherwise known as EPI, during this talk. So we're going to define what EPI is. I'm going to discuss the prevalence of EPI among different disease states. And I'm actually going to review a screening tool. Um, UCLA Health is part of a cancer collective um, coalition, if you will, with 15 other centers across the um, United States. And we have, as a registered dietitian, expert-led team developed a proposed screening tool that we are using in our integrated practice unit here in our pancreatic cancer population at UCLA Health. So, so what is EPI? So EPI really is a condition that is caused by the inadequate production activity or delivery of pancreatic enzymes needed for normal digestion. Um, so the exocrine pancreas produces our three main um, pancreatic enzymes, including lipase, amylase, and protease. And I think that is important to understand. It's not just lipase. Um, I often see this can be a little bit of a misconception with pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy with patients being told that they don't need them unless there's fat in their meals. Um, but we, we also have to remember that the pancreas does secrete all three digestive organ, um, digestive enzymes, including lipase, protease, and amylase, which are needed for the digestion of our carbohydrates, our fats, and our proteins. So really diagnosing um, EPI is, is difficult. It's largely clinical in nature. And I do wanna highlight that there's not a published or validated tool um, to identify EPI in clinical practice. It's difficult. This is not easy. Um, signs and symptoms of EPI really do overlap with a number of different GI conditions, which is why we often see EPI is underdiagnosed, underrecognized, and overlooked in many cases. Um, EPI is seen in various disease states and conditions, which I will highlight later today and give you a little bit of what we know about the prevalence in EPI and some of the emerging literature in this space. Um, and it can be transient in certain cases and present at varying times after a clinical diagnosis or a resection surgery. Diagnostic testing is limited, which only further complicates this and makes this more difficult for clinicians to recognize. Um, some of the underlying mechanisms of the development of EPI um, consist of the loss of functioning parenchyma, specifically in our chronic pancreatitis, our pancreatic cancer, or our resection surgeries thereof, um, decreased secretin despite intact parenchyma, which we may see in cases of obstruction of the pancreatic duct. And lastly, asynchrony. Um, so this is a little bit of a new hot topic, if you will, if you go back to the literature, we're starting to see EPI popping up in cases such as um, gastric bypass, ruin Y surgeries, and other complex GI surgeries. The Really, the symptoms tend to be very nonspecific. Um, what we do often see is that the severity of symptoms may also depend on the degree of EPI that is present in that individual. Um, so EPI, again, is often underdiagnosed. Um, the inadequate treatment is often seen in these patients, and the treatment that may be prescribed may not be optimized for that particular patient. Um, so something I'll highlight later today as well is, Oftentimes I see a patient who comes to me and I really ask them, how are they taking their pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy that's prescribed? And they say, well, on my bottle, it says TID three times a day. So I take it at these three times. Um, and, and that's, you know, we're, we're kind of missing the point of what the pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy is at that point. Um, so really kind of diving in to better understand what your patients are doing with perhaps a prescription or a medication regimen that you have them on. Um, a study by Landers in 2016 was a retrospective study um, looking at 129 patients with metastatic pancreatic cancer and actually found 21 patients were prescribed um, pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy and then looked at that 129 patients and found that actually 70% of those patients um, had marked uh, signs or symptoms of EPI, which I'll show you later today in our developed screening tool. 
So this is a little graphic that I made, but I think it does highlight um, that a lot of these different bubbles, if you will, are often inter overlapping or interrelated in many ways. Um, so for some extent, it's kind of the chicken or the egg. Um, so we see, you know, pancreatic insufficiency can develop. We have malnutrition, micronutrient deficiencies to consider, oral intake. So many of these things, again, kind of coexist or push one another, or oftentimes many of them um, are present and variables we need to consider, especially um, this publication really looking at chronic pancreatitis, as well as patients with pancreatic cancer diagnosis. So some conditions associated with um, EPI. On the left-hand side, I put these two, which from if we're really looking at a diagnostic and a coding standpoint, these two are really the front runners, if you will, in the literature. Um, so we see chronic pancreatitis, or CP, in our pancreatic cancer tend to be over 60% of the cases that we do see coded when we pull out our ICD-10 codes in um, the various studies. On the right-hand side, while well, cystic fibrosis, of course, um, very highly prevalent. We see nine out of 10 people within their first year tend to have a degree of EPI. Um, but also considering and considering keeping EPI in the differential of some of these other conditions um, where patients may be presenting with some of these symptoms or signs consistent for EPI. So really kind of in the back of our minds considering this in cases of more of our severe acute pancreatitis, um, gastric resections and bypass, as I mentioned before with asynchrony being an underlying mechanism, um, type one diabetes, Crohn's disease, as well as celiac disease. So testing considerations, um, and I'm gonna go over a little bit of what the literature reports in this area as well. Pancreatic function tests that we have, um, less invasive at the top, we see FE1, really our fecal last days, which tends to be the most widely available and widely used. Um, in clinical practice, really measuring the amount of elastase produced by the pancreas. However, we have to also understand the limitations of some of these tests. Um, FE1 tends to have a lower sensitivity uh, for, for mild cases of EPI, as well as it can have false positives if we're having a watery stool sample. So really asking our patients what are their stools looking like before we're ordering some of these tests, which may not um, produce a result that we may find is accurate. A fecal fat test, um, I'd like to ask you all how many of you would like to collect your stool for three days and keep it in your fridge? Um, probably not a ton of you, and also making sure that you know, if we're collecting fecal fat tests on our patients, ensuring that the patient understands they need to have a certain amount of fat in their diet, really to produce a reliable test. Um, so many patients, when you really kind of dive into their diet history, we see a lot of them are self-restricting and really trying to pull out some of these foods, specifically fat being often a trigger um, for many GI symptoms of patients. So if you've got a patient on a very low fat diet, um, we're not quite preparing for this test as it's in, um, indicated to. And then we've got our secretin pancreatic function test, um, which is gonna be that more invasive test, if you will, less commonly seen in clinical practice. So signs and symptoms of EPI, I did a little cutout for you all just to show you what our work group has um, come up with. So this is a screening tool that we have embedded into our integrative practice unit. Again, there is no um, validated or currently published tool. Um, so we've kind of taken it upon ourselves to put something together and hopefully we are collecting data on this and looking into um, what that could look like later on from a research perspective, but we really kind of um, our group is looking at um, excessive gas in patients, internal bloating or that feeling of that kind of internal pressure, if you will, in the abdomen, a lot of flatulence, very foul smelling flatulence, um, early satiety, abdominal pain or cramping, particularly around the time of having a bowel movement, um, hyperactive bowel sounds, changes in bowel habits, which I'll talk to you about in just a minute, um, having floating, greasy, oily stools, stools that are tan or clay colored in nature, um, really restricting or changing what, what you're eating or what a patient may be eating to help manage their GI symptoms is really something to explore when you're looking up or you're really keeping EPI in the differential. Um, and then looking at the changes of bowel habits, more specifically, you'll see in the right-hand side of those little bubbles, 
So we're looking at increased frequency or, or patients starting to have more bowel movements or increasing their frequency, um, particularly around mealtimes. Are we seeing these um, very loose or kind of liquid in nature stools, if you will? Large volume, fluffy or floating stools. Um, stools which are again light or tan colored or even a yellow in color or stools um, which are floating or dispersing in the toilet bowl as well as increased urgency. Um, so I'm always asking patients, are you, are you having to run to the bathroom? Are you not able to drive anymore because you're afraid of eating or going to restaurants? So it's, um, it's not just steatorrhea that we're really looking for. Um, and then this slide really highlights that that steatorrhea may not occur until 90% of pancreatic output has been compromised. Um, so these are just some examples and snippets of the smart phrases or smart lists. Um, so I encourage you in your practices or with your teams to work on creating some standardized criteria for clinicians to be able to recognize and really screen through and help identify um, and look at if patients are having pancreatic insufficiency that might otherwise be overlooked. Um, again, steatorrhea is not that one marker. There's many things to consider um, with a diagnosis of insufficiency. So going into the literature for our last couple of minutes, um, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, or NCCN as you know it, um, they published in 2021, deficiency in pancreatic enzymes results in inadequate absorption of fat, carbohydrates and proteins, again, those three uh, macronutrients, leading to steatorrhea, abdominal cramps, weight loss, and malnutrition. Because pancreatic exocrine insufficiency occurs in up to 94% of patients undergoing pancreatic surgery, therapy may be initiated without diagnostic tests. So this is really something um, to kind of bring home and evaluate in your practice and, and with your teams if we really are following these up-to-date NCCN guidelines. A newer uh, UK practical guidelines in 2021, um, again, the literature in EPI is pretty, pretty scarce, to be honest. We don't have robust data. Um, we don't have high quality data. We don't have a lot of prospective data. A lot of the data we do see published is observational or retrospective in nature with small sample sizes. Um, so this is a great area for research if any of you are interested. Um, but our UK practice practical guidelines that were published um, kind of bucket into two different categories. PEI is highly likely with high benefit from pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy with no further testing required if signs and symptoms are present. Um, and these include head of pancre uh, pancreas cancer, pre or post surgery for the head of a pancreas cancer, Tumor, uh, total pancreatectomy, of course, uh, steatorrhea or malabsorption, and chronic pancreatitis with dilated, dilated um, pancreatic duct or severe pancreatic calcification or severe necrotizing pancreatitis cases. On the right-hand side, we do want to look up um, a little bit more of an objective clinical workup, if you will. So the recommendation is to require initial investigation uh, with a fecal elastase stool sample for GI symptoms of maldigestion in secondary care with or without um, known condition. GI symptoms including steatorrhea, weight loss, diarrhea, abdominal pain or bloating, or associated conditions as previously I highlighted before, uh, celiac disease, IBSD, HIV, type one diabetes, uh, mellitus, acute pancreatitis after the initial phase has resolved. If you have not seen, the AGA does offer a EPI um, patient education resource um, information. So this is a great way if in your practice, um, there's a little bit of gap per se of the education that you are offering patients around the recognition and treatment and intervention of um, working with EPI patients. I do encourage to kind of explore what resources are available. Um, so that way when I'm seeing patients, they're not taking enzymes when they're drinking water or they're taking it at 8 a.m., noon, and 5 p.m., but they eat six times a day. So a lot of these things, we've really got to work together to troubleshoot some of these areas um, so that the pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy that they are taking is effective, it's dosed properly, um, and we're able to see hopefully a clinical benefit to get some symptom resolution for these patients, as well as um, quality of life improvement. Um, there is a data which I did not list up here, um, but Dominguez Munoz in 2018 
actually retrospectively looked at 160 patients with unresectable pancreatic cancer and reported a median survival benefit of three months in patients who were taking pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy um, and also had an improved nutritional status. So that was independently associated with a survival benefit in those, that patient group. So some practical and takeaway applications to take home with. Um, screening is key, so identifying how are you screening your patients for EPI, and is this practice that you're screening um, standardized among your colleagues and other providers that you're working with, so we're all kind of on the same page, particularly when we're reassessing and rescreening our patients. And if we're in, in the standard of care being prescribing pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy, but also recognizing you must educate your patients on how to take that, what really the part is being used for, and when or when not to take it. Thank you so much.